Thank you all for attending tonight. Um, we're here to talk about marsh migration and uh, the potential effects of sea level rise on Scarborough Marsh. Um, my name's Jay Chase. For those I haven't had a chance to meet yet, I'm the assistant planner in town. Um, just a little bit of background of where of what Scarborough has been doing in in regards to or in terms of sea level rise. Back in I think it was uh, late 2008 or 2009, we began looking at um, the impact of sea level rise with the communities of Saco, Biddeford, and Old Orchard Beach with the help of our friends at Southern Maine Regional Planning, a um, group affectionately called SLOG, to look at the effects of sea level rise on Saco Bay. Really, we've been looking at it in a regional, uh, the regional impacts and vulnerabilities within, within the Saco Bay region. Um, about six months ago or so, in the spring of this year, uh, I saw an email came across my desk that there was a, a coalition of state agencies that had come together to um, re requesting participants to study the effects of sea level rise specifically on marshes in the, in the state. Um, and it seemed like a sort of a natural progression for the community to take the work we've been doing regionally to really hone the scope, if you will, to our community. Um, had an opportunity to speak with our friends at the Conservation Commission, uh, friends of Scarborough Marsh, as well as the Scarborough Land Trust, gauge their interest in participating and learning what, what, uh, what might come of this. Um, and we'll hear more from, from the uh, folks at the state about how their coalition came together. Um, so really tonight, as I said, we're here, we're going to hear a presentation to begin to visualize and understand potential impacts that sea level rise may have in our community on Scarborough Marsh's natural and built environment. Um, this isn't intended to be a chicken little, the sky is falling <laughs> type report. Some of the slides we'll see tonight are pretty stunning. You know, I, yeah, we're going to run through a series of, of um, sea level uh, uh, scenarios from, up from one foot, I think, to a maximum six, about six and a half feet. And again, we'll get into more detail as that goes. And some of those are, as I said, uh, some of the slides, a lot of what used to be land looks blue and watery. Um, these are issues that are out quite a ways, and we're really at the beginning. We're just trying to understand what the potential impacts are, um, and how they might impact, you know, our community. I, I think, you know, it was interesting. About two or three weeks ago, uh, National Geographic came to my doorstep, and sea level rise was sort of on the cover. And actually, the editor in chief has a great quote in here that really helped. Uh, really articulated the way I've been thinking about the problem in a much more better way than I could. Um, so I'm just going to read a, a sentence or two that he had in here. And you know, before I do that, I guess one of the things I, I'd like to say about sea level rise is you know, there's a great deal of science and the you know the scientific uh, uh, folks who study these issues are generally are coalesced around the fact that sea level is changing how dramatically that's going to change in the next hundred years, that's a big question mark. It, could it be a couple inches? Could it be the six and a half feet scenario we're going to see? You know, I think there, there's some unknown there. And, and you know, again, uh, we'll hear a much more about that as we go through tonight. But as I said, you know, I'm going to quote here from the editor. He says, because there are no computer models or scientists to tell us with certainty how fast or how much the sea r will rise, it's a challenge to illustrate the story. He goes on to say that it takes a, a leap of faith and imagination that's grounded in fact. And I think that's, for me, sort of the, what sort of struck a chord with me anyway. Is, you know, again, the science is there. We have, we're going to see from the presentation what the recent trends over the last 100 years or so, the sea level rise. It's the next 100 years that there's a bit of uncertainty around. Um, again, as I said, this isn't, gonna, this isn't intended to be a chicken little we need to do, we need to jump on this immediately, but it is good to start planning and thinking about these issues. Uh, so the presentation will include simulations of uh, potential future migration on the marsh system, the values that the marsh provides, predicted changes to the ecology, as well as an assessment of public uh, infrastructure that uh, is at risk from sea level rise. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Liz Hertz, who's sort of the project coordinator from the state level to introduce our other presenters tonight. I'll step aside 
probably about 45 minutes to an hour of presentation. Then we're going to just have an open-ended discussion. Um, and, and so with that, I'll turn it to Liz, as I said. I'll stand here, too, because if I stood there, you'd never see me. But my name is Liz Hurst, and I'm currently the director I'm currently the director of the Municipal Planning Assistance Program at the Department of Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry. And I'm here representing as well the Maine Coastal Program, which is also now part of the same department. And through the Maine Coastal Program, we competed for, we being, and I'll tell you who it is, but a, a group of state and um, non-governmental organizations formed a partnership to compete for a grant from NOAA. And we were awarded one of the few grants that they gave out for what they call projects of special merit. And we had identified that Understanding in Maine with home rule and um, shrinking budgets at the state government level that more and more of the action is going to happen and be determined at the local level. But what we wanted to be able to do was provide municipalities and local groups with the best available science on sea level rise and in this case marsh migration in order to help communities plan ahead and develop adaptation strategies as appropriate and based on what they felt was important to them in the community. So we, we won the award from NOAA and we sent the letter out that Jay mentioned looking for interested communities. One thing we've learned over time is you can take the town to water, but you can't make it plan. So we were looking for communities that were at least interested in having the discussion with no predetermined outcome. Each, there are six communities that were chosen. Scarborough is one of them. And each community has developed and is going through a community-driven process looking at the scientific data that we are providing for each community, and then we're also hoping to provide support as the community works through analyzing that data in relationship to what's important to you folks. Um, we all know that it's less expensive and less traumatic if you can plan ahead rather than react to an emergency. So. There are opportunities for all of us in relation to the expected effects of sea level rise, and especially in Scarborough's position, marsh migration, to look at things over time and prepare over time rather than find ourselves sort of backed up against the wall reacting to some potential catastrophic situation 50 or 75 years down the road. I want to introduce the partners, and then I'm going to turn the presentation over to the smart people. Um, but we partnered with Maine Geological Survey, Pete Slavinsky, who does all this magic with numbers and creates wonderful stuff, and Steve Walker, who at the time that we submitted our grant to NOAA was working for Inland Fisheries and Wildlife, and now works for Maine Coast Heritage Trust and we've been lucky enough to be able to retain him in the partnership as one of what we call our marsh migration team. The Wells Reserve, also we have Chris Fort over here, who's part of our team, and then um, me from the Municipal Planning Assistance Program who kind of keeps, tries to keep everybody moving in the same direction and brings food when necessary. So, with that, I'm going to turn the evening over to Pete. Um, I will also mention that I have a one-page, very easy survey that if you would be so kind to fill out at the end of the evening, it would help us improve the presentation and the way that we deliver information to you in the future and help us 
sort of in this community-driven process make sure that we're addressing the issues that are important to you. So I'm just going to drop a few at each row, and if you'd pass them down, and if there's leftovers, just set them on the floor and we'll pick them up. And if there's not enough, I apologize, and I'll make sure to get you one next time. Thanks. Pete? Uh, thanks, Liz. Um, good evening, everyone. It's really, really nice to be here um, from the state side. I'm a Scarborough resident. Um, I live about a mile from the beach. Spend a lot of time in the coastal wetlands fishing. Um, I'm a surfer, so I'm at the beach all the time. So we're doing this work in the town um, was really fun for for me because it's in my backyard. So. I'm going to be sharing with you um, some information first on the science of sea level rise. We want to set the stage for what we're looking at uh, in terms of these scenarios. And then we're going to talk a little bit about storm surge because um, we take into account storm surge in the work that we're doing um, indirectly, and I'll show you how we do that. And then I'm going to spend about 15 minutes highlighting some of the results from this study which, which is where we'll actually get into the, the down and dirty of what some of the potential impacts uh, are in town. And we're going to be looking specifically at marshes, but we're also going to be looking at some of the impacts to road infrastructure in town. So uh, I'm going to spend about 15 minutes going over some of the science, and then we'll get into the pretty pictures. So the first thing we have to talk about is why do we actually see sea level changes? Um, when we talk about sea levels, there's really two different things that, are, that we need to discuss. First are global changes, that is what's happening on a global scale. And those global changes are really driven by two dominant processes. The first is simply the concept as you heat up the ocean water, it expands. That's thermal expansion. The second is volumetric increase, or as you have melting of land-based ice sheets and glaciers, you're actually physically increasing the volume of the um, oceans. I'm not going to really touch too much on global climate variation, but that can have short-term impacts, which I'll highlight in one slide later. But what we really want to focus on in Maine in setting the stage is what we call relative or local sea levels. That is, what is sea level doing in relation to the land mass, and what is the land mass doing in relation to and in response to glaciation? Okay, so we're going to be talking about isostatic rebound, which is the land mass responding to weight of glaciers, and also, not really too much, subsidence or sinking of the land mass um, due to other factors. We don't have that much subsidence going on in southern Maine anymore. Um, if you want to see real subsidence, you have to go down to the mid-Atlantic or Gulf states where sea levels are rising at the same rate that they're sinking. So you have a compound, compounded effect. So being a scientist, I'm going to throw some graphs at you while everybody's awake. And after you see the graphs, you can then fall asleep. Um, this is actually a, a, a graph going back 13,000 years showing sea level on the y-axis and time from, from now going back 13,000 years, reconstructing what sea levels have done. And I'm doing this to set the stage to show you why what we're seeing are important. Basically, 13,000 years ago, sea levels were about 70 meters above present, so 220-some feet above present. A lot of folks think that, oh, this was a time when, when uh, the, the climate was warm, everything was melted. It's actually, actually the complete opposite. We had about three-quarters of a mile of ice on top of us where we are right now. The, the analogy I like to use is, uh, imagine you have a Tempur-Pedic mattress. That's the land mass. Okay? When you lie down on that Tempur-Pedic mattress, your body is the glacier. What happens to that mattress? It sinks. It's exactly what happened to the landmass underneath the weight of the ice. It actually sank so that the ocean was above the current level. Now, over a period of 2,000 years, that ice melted. And geologically speaking, that's very fast. And what happened is, is just like when you get up off of that mattress, was it, what does it do? Well, it bounces back up. And that's what happened here, such that we had a sea level low stand 11,000 years ago at 60 meters below present. Okay? Then what happened in this location right here is what we call meltwater pulse. That is, the land stopped rebounding, and the, glacier, the melt from the glaciers caught up and surpassed the rate that the land was rebounding, such that you had really, really high sea level rise rates right here. Okay? There's an adjustment of the crust here and some slight changes here, but what we really want to start getting into is what's happened over the last four to 5,000 years. When the topic of tonight, which is marshes, when the majority of those marshes formed. 
they formed under sea level rise scenarios which were almost static. And I'll show you in that red box what sea levels actually were during that time period. They were about, this was supposed to be 0.2, it got cut off, 0.2 to 1.2 millimeters per year. So really, really small changes when these marshes formed. Okay? This is from radiocarbon dating down in wells. What we're going to look at now is this little red box where we actually have measurements of sea level changes. Not reconstructions, but measurements. This is from the Portland Tide Gauge, just up the coast. Uh, this is sea level on the y-axis and time going back from current back to 1912. We have 100 years of data. And uh, this, basically, this is an annualized sea level trend here with a linear fit through it. Okay? That linear fit is telling us that we are seeing about 1.9 millimeters per year. It doesn't sound like much, but if you extrapolate it over 100 years, it's about 7.5 inches. Geologically, that is significant because it's the fastest rate we've had in the last 5,000 years. It's, fast, much, it's double the rate that the majority of our modern day coastal features like beaches and wetlands formed. All right? So that's significant. It's also generally matching what's happened over the last 100 years uh, on the global ocean scale. So where may it go? This is actually an older image from 2001. This is from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and they've actually released a newer study recently, but I'm not going to be discussing that much uh, in this presentation. These are a bunch of climate model outputs that are suggesting where sea level may go under a variety of different conditions. Okay? The red line is what we want to pay attention to here. That's the mean. The mean value that's predicted on this model, which varies from all the way up here down to here, is about 2 feet, 1.6 feet by the year 2100. What's important about this is this model did not take into account anything to do with the melting of land-based ice sheets. So nothing to do with Greenland, nothing to do with Antarctica. So it's a somewhat conservative prediction of what some of the changes might be. What we now want to look at is the data that's actually been captured from global sea levels in that yellow box from 1993 to 2013. This is captured from satellite altimetry, um, satellites basically going over the Earth. They, me they can measure sea levels, and uh, they can reconstruct those levels uh, right through here. And you can see that this has been rising at a rate of about 3.2 millimeters per year, so about a foot per century, if not a little bit more. So um, we were, remember, over the last 100 years, about 1.8 millimeters per year. So there's been an acceleration over the last 20 years. Okay? Now, if we take this image inside the yellow box, so the predicted scenarios, and combine it with this image, we end up with this. These are tide gauge measurements out here. This is the satellite data in red. This, these are the predictions from the third and fourth IPCC assessments. So this is the mean value right in here. So we are currently trending 60% faster okay, than the initial predictions uh, from this 2001 study. So we at, are at 3.2. This is, was predicting around 2 millimeters per year right around here. So that's significant. So I said, well, what's happening in Maine during that time period? Because remember, we've been pretty much matching global oceans over the last 100 years. So we're going to look in this red box now over the last 20 years. We've also seen an acceleration. It's been a little bit more. It's up to about 4.4 millimeters per year. Now, it's important to note that this has an error of about 1.2, so there's more variability in our data. But even if you go to the lower end of that, you're still seeing an acceleration over the overall trend. So something is causing our sea levels to rise faster than they have been over the last 100 years. So where may they go if we take into account ice sheet processes? This is from the Intergovernmental, oh, not Intergovernmental Panel, sorry, National Climate Assessment. This came out in December. Um, and what they basically say is we have a very high confidence that sea level will rise at least 0.2 meters and maybe up to about 2 meters by the year 2100. So these are all different models that take into account basically the historical trend. This just takes into account just additional warming that may happen due to climate change. The intermediate high scenario takes into account some glacial melt and input from the ice sheets. And the highest takes into account basically the worst case scenario, I guess you could say, that's reasonably expected by the year 2100. We're not talking about catastrophic failure of Greenland or Antarctica or anything like that. So the state of Maine in 2006 adopted two feet as a middle of the road approach. Okay? So what do we actually use? Well, in approaching a project like we are with it here, we suggest using what's called a scenario-based approach. That is, look at all of these scenarios 
in the context of their impacts, and start using those scenarios as different planning mechanisms. That is, look at one foot by the year 2050. Most scientists agree that's probably where we might be. Once you get past that, you're talking a little bit of a, little bit of a gray area as to where it might go. So, but look at those scenarios and plan accordingly. So that's what we did. So what about storm surge? Why is this all cut off? I'm not quite sure. Uh, full screen mode, that's probably why. Ha ha, there we go. So uh, I want to cover quickly what we mean by storm tides and storm surge. As we, we know, this is an image from uh, Superstorm Sandy in New York. Storm surge is actually just the difference between a predicted and an observed tide. So if we have a normal high tide of two feet here, and we have an overall water level that's measured at 17 feet. The storm surge is considered to be 15 feet, while the storm tide is considered to be that overall 17 feet. Okay? So I'm going to be going over some data here. Going back to Superstorm Sandy, this is from Kings Point, New York. Their tide gauge down there. It's a gauge that measurements the, me measures the water levels as it goes up and down. Predicted tides, the ones you can see in tide tables, are these blue ones, this blue line right here. Observed water is this red. The difference between those two is the green that you see here and this arrow is showing the maximum surge that occurred. That hit at low tide, but it was you know, 13 feet of surge that hit at low tide. However, the following high tide cycle, you see the overall water level was 14.2, 14.3 feet with about 7 feet of surge. That was the highest water level they've ever recorded at that station, and it's over 100 years old. Now, at Portland, during the same exact event, we had a maximum of 3.2 feet of surge, and it corresponded with dead low tide. And the following high tide, we had less about 2 feet of surge, so we had a maximum water level around 12 feet. That's like the highest tide of the year in Maine. We had very little impact from storm surge, per se, due to Superstorm Sandy. What this is telling us is that it's a combination of high tides and storm surge, or that storm tide that causes our problems. So um, having a lot of free time on my hands, I uh, went back and said, oh, let's mine all the data, 100 years of data from the Portland Tide Station and figure out, let's not go into my email. Okay. Let's figure out what surges corresponded with mean high water or greater. Okay, so remember, we have to have some kind of high water plus a surge to create problems along our coastal communities. So what this table is showing is the return interval. So what that means is if we have a one-year one return interval, that means there's a 100% chance that that water level will be met in a given year. Conversely, you've heard this before. The 100-year storm or the 100-year return interval simply means that there's a 1% chance that that will be achieved in any given year. So it's all statistics. Don't talk to it. Don't, don't refer to things as a 100-year storm. Call it the 1% storm. It's a lot better statistically. Anyway, what this is showing is we should expect one foot of surge, you know, is 100% every year, uh, corresponding with mean high water or greater. A 10-year a ten storm has a 2.5 two feet of surge, roughly. 50-year storm has 3.3, and the 100-year storm has about 3.7. So I went and, top, and graphed out the top 25 storm surges that corresponded with mean high water or greater. And some folks may remember some of these. This was the Groundhog Day storm in 1972, Perfect Storm in 1991, Blizzard of 78, which is our 1% storm. I'll show you why in a little bit. And here's the Patriot's Day storm, a little bit over two and a half feet of surge. So when we actually talk about storm tides, this is where the numbers get more impressive. Same recurrence intervals. But if we're looking at a one-year event, that's 11.7 feet. The highest predicted tides for a year are about 11.5, 11.6 feet mean lower low water. So this is going to be happening every year. Ten-year event is 13 feet. Okay? That was the Patriot's Day storm right there, 13 feet. Our 100-year storm or our 1% event is 14 feet. That was the 1978 event. So there's only a one-foot difference between these, our 10-year event and our 100-year event. So if we have one foot of sea level rise, we will be feeling the impacts of a 100-year storm on a 10-year recurrence interval. Okay? So that's significant from when it comes to a planning standpoint. Last graph, and I promise we'll move on to some cooler stuff. This is showing uh, graphs of the top 25 storm tides that have ever been recorded. 
The blue is the tidal component of the storm. The red is the surge, the storm surge. So blizzard of 1978 in February was our highest recorded water level. And then there are some other events. Here's the Patriots Day storm. Here's the Groundhog Day storm. Here's the Halloween storm, or the perfect storm in 91. It's number 25. So I'm not going to read this, but basically I think the take-home points from this background science is we should expect one foot by 2050, two to three feet, maybe more, by the year 2100. We should use a scenario-based approach in looking at these things. I think it's very important that we need to consider that just one foot will have a significant impact on the intensity and recurrence interval of the storms that we see. And for this study, we looked at a range of scenarios, one foot, two feet, one meter, or 3.3 feet, and six feet. You can look at these as sea level rise scenarios, if you'd like, or you can look at them as storm surge scenarios that correspond with the highest tide of the year. De depends on how you want to look at it. So how do we actually use this stuff? Well, I'm going to cover a little bit about what we use data called light detection and ranging. And this is actually laser data that's flown in an airplane. They shoot lasers at the ground. It bounces off the ground, goes back to the airplane. And they measure how fast the airplane is going, how high it is. We're able to create what's called a digital elevation model from that. Okay, it bounces off trees, it bounces off houses, bounces off the ground, and then the trees and houses and all that other stuff are removed, and what you're left with is what's called a bare earth model. And this is what the bare earth model uh, in kind of three dimensions looks like for Scarborough. The arrow that I have here, here's the Scarborough marsh system. Uh, the arrow that I have here is pointing to an area of the marsh that we actually went into and did what's called ground truthing. Uh, we, went and we wanted to make sure the data we're working with is very accurate, so we use this GPS, which is accurate to about an inch. Um, and we measure the marsh surface. We get muddy. We get bitten by bugs, and we should be wearing waders, but it was too hot that day. Uh, but then what we're able to do is compare the elevations that are actually on the ground with the LIDAR data. And these colors just show the difference in meters between those. It's not really that important to look at, but over the time, over the last couple of years, we've surveyed in 22 municipalities and taken 3,500 points. And the mean difference between those is 2.2 inches. The root mean square error, which is an, uh, a measure of, of um, basically the error associated with this number, is about 6 inches. So we're good either side of 6 inches when we're using this data. Okay, so it's very, very accurate at allowing us to simulate flooding and marsh migration. So how do we do it? Well, we have a definition for a coastal wetland. Uh, it's in Maine's municipal shoreland zoning, with which Scarborough's in. And it's all this yada, 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 but it also relates to the highest tide level for each year. So that's printed in tide tables. So we can use that as proxies for wetland surfaces. When you go out on the marsh, you typically see uh, different types of grasses that are out there, different types of vegetation. They're driven by different tidal elevations. The low marsh, or the higher cord grass, it's called, that is adjacent to most channels, basically exists from mean tide level to mean high water. From mean high water to highest annual tide is what we call our high marsh. That's the majority of Scarborough's marshes. It's that beautiful looking salt hay that gets all, it looks like hair almost on the marsh. It's beautiful stuff, especially in the fall. So we can actually use the elevation from mean tide level to highest annual tide as a proxy for the coastal wetland. So how do we do that? Well, this is an infrared color photograph showing the marsh system um, this is, uh, where am I here? This is uh, Old Neck area right in here. Um, this is uh, the Scarborough River, of course. This is Ferry Beach, Pine Point. But this just has a different return intensity on different vegetation. You can see the marsh really clearly here. So our friends at the Maine Natural Areas Program have digitized the marsh surface in this green. So what I wanted to do was replicate this marsh surface by using LIDAR elevations and those tidal elevations I was talking with you about. And we can do it really, really well. The light green is my LIDAR-defined uh, marsh system. Okay, it's about 90% accurate. So we're pretty happy with those results. So this is what we've simulated as part of this study. I'm going to talk mostly about the marsh system itself and not anything to do with the 1% storm here. This data is done. It'll be readily available for the community to use, and Jay will have it. So what did we actually look at? Well, the first thing is, what are the potential changes to the wetland systems in terms of the overall wetlands and the types of wetlands, the high marsh and low marsh areas that we have? 
what are the potential impacts to adjacent uplands? What areas of uplands are going to be impacted, and what are they? We used main land cover data to look at what are those adjacent uplands that are going to be impacted. We looked at inundation uh, due to the highest annual tide plus those scenarios I talked about. And then we looked at impacts to critical transportation infrastructure, namely roads in town and the, the Pan Am rail line. First, I have to go over some quick assumptions. These are very important to spell out. Our LIDAR data that we have came from a flight in 2006 and 2010. Okay, so it's static. Anything that's changed since then has changed. We're using data that's old. That's I mean, unless it's flown every day, we're, in a, we're talking about really dynamic systems, and it's almost impossible to keep up perfectly. So it's just a snapshot of topography. Remember, we're using tidal elevations as proxies for wetlands. It can't, uh, we can't account for changes in tides due to tidal restrictions, such as roads or anything like that. We're using what's called a bathtub simulation here. That is, water at time A rises to water at time B. Okay, we're not taking into account for erosion, accretion, or waves. And our vertical accuracy is pretty good, but remember, this is just a planning tool. If I have a line that shows uh, that it stops at some road, there's a chance that flooding may go over that road at some point. You know, don't expect this to be, oh, my house is dry, that's it. If, you know, just use it as a planning, a planning tool. So, let's start looking at some of these results. Uh, again, low marsh uh, exists adjacent to these tidal channels. It exists from mean tidal, mean tidal level to mean high water. High marsh is this salt hay up in here, and juncus up in this area, the darker stuff. And that's mean high water to highest annual tide. So for the whole town, this is what that looks like. It's about 75% high marsh, 25% low marsh, roughly. It's a little bit different than that. It's actually 76 and 24, I think. But you can see all the areas that are dominated by the high marsh, okay? And you can see the areas that are dominated by low marsh. Now, let's keep an eye on this and see how it changes over time as we're looking at this through a one foot, two foot, three feet, and six foot scenario. Okay, so this is existing conditions. There's one foot. What's the biggest change you see? It goes from light green dominated to dark green dominated. What this is telling us is a lot of our existing high marsh is adjacent to steeper sloped uplands. There isn't that much room for it to move. It can move a little bit in some areas. What is going to change is the lower boundary. Okay? You're going to have what's called transgression. That is, the low marsh is going to encroach into the high marsh areas. Those are the flat areas where water can come in on a regular basis, and it's going to change the look of the marsh. Okay, let's keep an eye on the changes. So we went from this to this to two feet, to three feet, to six feet. Now what happens in the six foot scenario? Well, everything that's water in here, okay? Anything that's not green is water, basically, uh, except for the land surface here, here, and all that. All of this converts to open water. So you're just left with these fringing marsh areas, and all this in here is water, okay? So I actually should color it dark blue, I guess. But um, that's a significant impact. So the take-home point here is we're going to see some significant changes in our overall wetlands under a one-foot scenario, a 13% increase uh, in terms of the size of the wetlands. Then there are some smaller increases. And then if we hit this six-foot scenario, there's going to be a significant decrease in the overall marsh system. Okay, there's no more room for it to move. It can't go anywhere else. It's just going to get pinched out between transgressing open water and steep sloped uplands. So I wanted to take a closer look now at just at this area and show you what some of those results look like because this parcel right here, uh, this is a Hampton Circle, I think, right here. Uh, and this is state-owned and town-owned lands right in here. This is all some of its freshwater, wa freshwater wetlands, some of its upland. And this is a great example of an area where you just allow natural processes to occur. So I wanted to look at this. So there's one foot. Two feet. Okay, note how that wet, the low marsh boundary is coming into where the high marsh was. But this, uh, it, this is all still good stuff for the marsh to move into. Three feet, and if we had it, six feet. So th all of this would be water, and then this would all be low marsh, and the high marsh would start impinging on property in that area, potentially. So the take-home point here is, we're going to see increases in low marsh. 
we're going to see decreases significantly in the area of high marsh potentially. And remember, we're not taking into account erosion and accretion. But based on these simulations, we're going to be losing some marsh and having a conversion of the overall system. So what types of land types might be impacted? Well, what, I, what we did here is we took the main land cover data set, which has a lot of different data, and grouped it into three things, natural, developed, and agricultural. So it's a lot easier to look at. So we overlaid that on the town. So this is all the developed land is in red, agricultural land at down near uh, uh, Prout's Neck in the Scarborough Beach area is in green, and the light green is what's considered natural. Okay. Let's focus in that white box. So again, this is the area we looked at earlier. That's the existing conditions. Now we're going to be looking at the uplands that are going to be impacted. What are the land types there? Mostly natural, a couple little developed areas. Two feet, three feet, and six feet. And again, you're seeing mostly uh, developed in this area, um, impacts in the developed areas here, but mostly natural and agricultural impacts. So the take-home point here is that the vast majority of our land cover type that's going to be impacted by the, all of the scenarios, 80% or more, is either natural or agricultural. Okay? The remaining developed areas are generally roads, and undeveloped portions of lots. So it's actually not impacting that many building footprints. Buildings are going to be impacted, don't get me wrong, but the majority of the developed stuff um, are uh, roads and um, just portions of lots. So in the last uh, five, ten minutes I have here, I'm going to take a look at transportation infrastructure. Um, and this is a picture of a high tide, highest tide of the year in 2011, uh, in Route 1. And as we all know, Route 1 does have some flooding problems. Um, this did not flood the road, but it came pretty darn close right there in terms of coming over. I literally watched it come up from here and come up right up into about here and then start receding. So this is the results of the whole town. What I'm showing here are um, dark red roads, are those roads that are submer submerged under highest annual tide currently. And there really are none. Uh, maybe one or two. Um, roads plus one foot, two feet, three feet, six feet are these different color-coded roads. And the things that pop out at me, yeah, there are, there are some smaller roads in certain areas that get hit, but what pops out for me is, number one, Route 1, major access point. Number two, Eastern Trail, that's where I walk. No, I'm just... Uh, but Eastern Trail is where a lot of people walk and recreate. Um, you know, and it is also is an emergency access route. Pine Point Road here, Pine Point Road here, and Black Point Road, which services this entire area. Okay? Those are the significant things I saw. But just to look at a different area, I wanted to jump down to Pine Point. So this is existing highest annual tide conditions. Nothing in Pine Point gets wet. Um, this is the clam bake. You can see the parking lot floods just like it does. The ditches over here flood just like they do. Um, this is the Old Orchard Beach town boundary. And then this road, I'm not sure what it's called, does have some potential flooding that occurs at highest annual tide. But that's Old Orchard, so we're not worried about it. Um, <laughs> no offense to anyone from Old Orchard. Um, so here's one foot. Again, the impacts are not terrible, but we're starting to see some, uh, especially here at Pine Point, right across from the clam bake and right at the, uh, uh, the converted church. I forget the name of it. Um, anyway, right in here. What is it? Lane. Yes, thank you. And then Snow Canning's Road is getting hit. Two feet. More significant impacts on Pine Point Road. This is just isolated flooding that occurs in here. Whether this actually connects, it's unclear. I left it because I wanted to show that that's a low-lying area that could potentially flood. Three feet and six feet. Now, this is one thing, you know, these are color-coded roads. It's fun to look at and all that. But what I wanted to do next is show you how we can actually examine the inundation depths along a certain surface. So we'll look at highest annual tide plus three feet along this stretch. So these are all depths, okay, under highest annual tide plus three feet. So we're seeing anywhere from zero to two feet of flooding in this area, um, four to six feet of flooding here, pretty significant stuff. But I drew a transect along Pine Point Road right through here, and uh, we're going to follow that transect. So we can actually look at what these inundation depths might be under a certain scenario. Great planning tool for public works or somebody who might be repaving this road or doing something to that road. Take home points for roads. We're going to see some significant impacts, about one and a half miles 
with one foot of sea level rise or if we have highest tide plus one foot of storm surge. Okay? If we have two feet, it more than doubles. So that's significant from a planning standpoint. So finally, I want to close looking at uh, the Pan Am rail line. Um, this is an image of it coming through the Scarborough Marsh system from Wikipedia. I didn't get out at the right time to take it. So this is, uh, again, so we're looking at Scarborough, Old Orchard Beach. Uh, here's the Pan Am rail line, Black Point Road. Um, so this is just kind of reorienting ourselves such that north is this way. So this is examining inundation extents under highest annual tide as the darkest blue, nothing's impacted, one foot, two feet, three feet, six feet, the different colors. It's great to look at, a lot of stuff looks like it gets wet, but what we want to look at, again, is the Pan Am rail line. So that we use the same color coding techniques here, uh, and as you can see, nothing really gets wet until we're looking at a highest annual tide plus um, two feet. There's a little bit that gets wet potentially around the one foot, but highest angle tide plus two feet, we're looking at a mile of rail line. That's one-tenth of the rail line that's in Scarborough. That's 10%. There's only 10 miles uh, in Scarborough. So that's significant. Right there is significant. Another way we can look at it is by looking at inundation depths. Again, these are all color-coded, um, zero to two feet, two to four feet, four to six feet, and so on. But it doesn't really stand out to me. So what I wanted to do was focus in on that. Uh, you can kind of see the depths a little bit better, but then again, we can draw a transect. And what we see here is this really high spike is a bridge. That's right there, so the bridge was removed. This high spike is the bridge right here. Okay? But what you can see is that this stretch of the, the, the Pan Am rail line is between three and four foot flooded um, under this scenario. So this is something that realistically could, could occur as a storm event right now. Uh, or we could look at this as a planning tool for three feet of sea level rise sometime in the future. So the take-home point here is with two feet of sea level rise, we start seeing significant impacts to the rail line. So closing points. I have to put the disclaimer in there. This is a planning tool. Everything I've showed you is simply used, this, this is to help visualize what some of the impacts might be. Simulations show that there's anywhere between 1,900 and 2,000 acres of adjacent uplands that might be available for wetland migration in a six-foot scenario, um, and then the breakdown for the other scenarios is here. And I think it's important to note that more than 80% is either natural or agricultural. Okay, so there's about 20% that's developed. In some cases, it's less. This is very important when we're talking about the marsh. Currently dominated by high marsh, 7327, and that will change as sea level rises, most likely. Uh, we will likely see conversion of marsh areas to open water, especially at the 3.3 and 6-foot scenarios. Okay, we're talking about longer-term changes here. We're not talking about storms. From a potential road impact, I really see that it's pretty important that we need to start planning for even one foot because we have Route 1, Black Point Road, and Pine Point Road already at risk from a storm. And uh, over the same thing, Pan Am down Easter Rail Line may be significantly impacted at two feet of sea level rise or if we have a two foot of storm surge corresponding with the highest tide of the year. Um, my closing point is, is that everything that we've created for this project is going to be converted into Google Earth format. It's going to be served up to the community. I don't know if Jay's going to house it or the Conservation Commission or whoever's going to house it, but all of this data will be available for people to look at at home on their own computers and all that stuff. And um, so with that, I was going to pass it on to Steve, who's going to talk about why we should actually care about the Marsh system. I'd probably preach into the choir here, but I think there, hang on, hang on, no, 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 view, full screen. Uh, I wanted to get to your email. <laughs> Thanks, Pete. Thank now you get to hear from the Bugs and Bunny guy. Good job. Um, I'll be brief because I'm sure everyone in this room who lives in Scarborough cares about salt marshes. It's one of the reasons why this community was founded. It certainly uh, adds to our property values in terms of the aesthetics and importantly, as Pete talked a lot about storm surge, it provides that natural protection that a lot of communities don't have right now. It's like a big sponge out there that can help buffer the effects of that surge. Um, but beyond those aspects, it's 
certainly adds uh, significantly to the local economy here, whether from a recreation standpoint. I come down here to recreate. I think I was one of the birders in that line on there on the marsh there. Um, duck hunters, bike riders on Eastern Trail, as Pete alluded to. There's a lot going on in Scarborough Marsh. It really defines who you are. And it also is sort of the underpinnings of our marine resource economy. Um, folks talk about marshes being nursery grounds. Well, they may not really be marine nursery grounds, but they certainly are a major engine of nutrient export feeding our systems, everything from the soft shell clam industry, lobster fishery, all the way out to uh, marine fin fish. These wetlands produce so much energy output that it fuels all these uh, commercial entities that really drive our local economy in so many ways. And of course, the ecology of the area. Um, this slide is tough to read, I apologize, but uh, bottom line is uh, Manomet Center for Conservation Sciences, a very strong conservation partner here in the state of Maine, did an economic analysis of ecosystem services associated with all kinds of different ecosystems. Salt marshes, of course, being one of them. And through this, I don't know how to use this, Pete. This is a little too technical. Red, right. red button on the side. It's, that's easy to say when you're 45 and blind. Uh, well, anyway, um, what this, the, oh, look at that. Um, Anyway, what they did, they went through everything from buffering capacity to recreation to aesthetics to habitat to you, you name it. Reviewed the literature and basically end of the day came to a, a pretty solid finding that salt marshes contribute per acre annually $1,400 to the local economy based on all these services, which is pretty darn significant. And then you think of about the losses we may be faced with under these sea level uh, rise scenarios and planning for future conservation of marshes and marsh migration areas becomes even more critical. Um, getting to a wildlife standpoint, I'm a wildlife biologist, of course, so this is what I love. I grew up birding in Scarborough Marsh and actually before coming here tonight was down at Dunstan Landing and was struck. Pete talked about um, the conversion of that high marsh habitat to low marsh habitat. I'm also the father of a four-year-old, so you can imagine in the past four years I've done very little birding in Scarborough Marsh, but got out there for 15 minutes tonight in a place I used to bird probably weekly um, where you had great high marsh habitat. You could see the salt marsh sparrows flitting around in it. It is almost entirely Spartina alterniflora, low marsh. Um, I could barely spot snowy egrets because the grass was so high. Um, so things are changing. But anyway, um, getting back to this slide, uh, IFNW, my former employer, has what's called a state wildlife action plan. Every state has one. It's a comprehensive assessment of what species are facing long-term declines. In that uh, assessment, there's 213 species of greatest conservation need. These are the lists for uh, coastal salt marshes, some of the priority species, things like salt marsh sparrow, glossy ibis, some of the great wading birds and shorebirds that you all know and love down here in Scarborough. Um, following this report, the state also did a vulnerability analysis based on climate change stressors, including sea level rise and invasive species increased precipitation, temperatures, you name it. And some of the species that really popped, of course, were these coastal wetland species that are already under threat due to habitat conversion over the past 100 or so years. Now with uh, the effects Pete talked to you about, conversion of one type of salt marsh to another and all that loss of salt marsh, uh, these species really pop in terms of needing, needing our attention from a conservation standpoint. Um, Scarborough Marsh, I hope you all know, has been designated as a focus area of statewide ecological significance. Um, the partners who have presented tonight, as well as other partners, Nature Conservancy, uh, Maine Coast Heritage Trust, Maine Audubon, uh, you name it, have contributed to efforts, of course your local land trusts have contributed to, to, to efforts to 
have conserved property all around Scarborough Marsh given the ecological values of it. Um, unfortunately, most of the wildlife management area is from high tide down, so it's primarily salt marsh. I think IF&W is now taking a good hard look at upland buffers as well to secure some of that land which may be marsh in the future. Um, the next series of slides I wanted to really drill down. Pete showed you the great model uh, scenarios from a satellite 30,000 foot level. This is down on the ground, and these pictures were actually taken yesterday where I live in Brunswick. This is Harpswell Cove, and what you see here, this stipply thing, you can see the line all the way out here. Two years ago, that was salt marsh. Um, we're already seeing significant diebacks in Casco Bay as a result of uh, as, a, as a result of sea level rise. Um, here are some more pictures in the same area. Uh, you can just see these denuded shelves. This is, we're talking acres and acres and acres per cove up that way. I haven't spent as much time in Scarborough Marsh recently, so I can't say for sure, other than my quick um, trip tonight to Dunstan Landing where it was pretty clear marsh conversion has already started. Um, and then a double whammy that you probably heard about on uh, main public radio tonight or probably have seen in the Press Herald, these little holes, because of the warmer water associated with climate change, not just sea level rise, we're seeing an uptick in invasive species, including green crabs, which love to burrow in coastal salt marshes. So at the edge of marshes, we're starting to see this beehive effect, and they're actually snipping the rhizomes of the plant. So those plants that are already stressed by uh, more frequent inundation are getting hit doubly hard with green crabs and other invasives as well. Um, this I could have easily taken pictures, and I planned to tonight, but the fog kept me from doing it. Um, this could easily have been off Route 1 just east of Ann John's restaurant. These are actually New Jersey shots, so I apologize for that. But um, you are seeing this in Scarborough currently as uh, you get more frequent inundation with the higher tides a dieback on that uh, riparian forest fringe, and under that you might have noticed IFNW has been treating for Phragmites up there because the first invader coming in once the forest canopy is gone is Phragmites. But the good news is over time, and I think we're already seeing it north of Route 1 by Ann Johns, um, with increased salinity, Spartina is starting to recolonize those areas. But as you're driving down the road, look for the forest dieback. It's a clear indication of what we're talking about tonight, the sea level rise that's already happening. So what do we do? Um, the key to conserving marshes, sea level is going to rise. We're bought into I don't know how many years of it or how many feet or inches, uh, but it's going to move. Um, the key to it is this concept of saving the stage or allowing that natural movement to happen. As the seas rise, the marshes are going to gradually march, march inland. Um, and the fewer obstacles or the more proactive conservation we can do in low-lying areas to facilitate that movement over time, the better off we're going to be. Certainly, we're not going to be able to conserve all the marsh acreage we have now, but keeping the landscape a little more fluid, a little more dynamic, less barriers is certainly a no regret solution we can do now. We certainly don't want to build in areas that are going to be inundated in the next 10, 20, 50 years. Um, technical me. I, I had animation here, but I, then I turned it into a PDF, so I lost all that. But I can still make some points with this. This was going to be images from 1953 all the way up to present of this area showing changes over time, but we can just jump right to 2013 here. There are still remaining fringe, as Pete pointed out in his uh, slides, 80 percent of what is anticipated to be underwater is still in natural or agricultural cover. So the good news is for Scarborough is we can still do some proactive conservation, some good land use planning to sort of keep those areas as much as possible free of development to allow marshes to move. Um, the golf course people would probably shoot me, but that's all right. I'm no longer in government anymore. But we also have um, 
opportunities for tidal restoration. This is a great example right here. These two uh, impounded freshwater ponds used to be tidal creeks and with proper restoration could come back to support future marsh marshes when every acre is going to count in the future. Um, and it's not just gradual uh, slopes that we're seeing. Uh, well, actually, this is a different subject altogether. It's getting late. Forget what I just started to say. Um, another impact we're seeing in Casco Bay, but also down this way, with increased sea level rise and increased storms, we're getting more and more erosion. And that can be a good thing. This is a picture, uh, I think, in McCoy Bay in Brunswick, where you get these presumpscot clays that then slump and slide down and create a great growing medium for marshes to reestablish. You can see this. This is a patch of marsh that uh, did reestablish on an old ero eroding bank. It's a natural source of sediment to feed marshes. Unfortunately, what we're seeing is people uh, really don't like the looks of that. Understandably, they want to uh, protect their investment in houses. But even on undeveloped sites, we're seeing an uptick in riprap because people fear uh, erosion and the looks of it and don't want to lose property. And that's, a, of course, pretty severe impediment to marsh migration in that location. So the last slide, this is the critical time to start thinking about how we can make the Scarborough waterfront more resilient. Um, not just sea level rise, not just climate change stress, the natural climate change stressors, but hey, Scarborough is a pretty nice place to live, especially if you're like in coastal Virginia or North Carolina where you're really going to be underwater fast um, and it's really going to get hot and expensive to air condition your house. I believe, um, as do others, that there's going to be a big uptick in folks looking to Maine as a pretty comfortable place to relocate. So let's support Jay Chase and the wonderful work the planning department does here in Scarborough. Let's support the Scarborough Land Trust, Friends of Scarborough Marsh, and of course Maine Coast Heritage Trust, and get in place the tools we need for uh, marshes in the future. And that's all I have, Jay. So I promise I didn't pay him for that last little part there. That was, uh, <laughs> um, so let's see, just to wrap up real briefly you know, on the presentation component of it, um, one thing that Pete had mentioned was all the information he provided. There's a great deal more data that he has. Once, they, once, once Pete and his group have that packaged up, we certainly hope to, uh, we'll be making that available, hopefully on the web, um, if not otherwise. But that is the intent at this point. Um, so I, I guess, as I said, I, I think what we'll do is we'll wrap up the presentation point, uh, 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 portion of the evening, and then we'll just have a, a sort of a roundtable, open-ended discussion, gauge your reactions, get some feedback and thoughts. We have Melissa Anson, who's a volunteer with the Scarborough Land Trust, has volunteered to take some, jot some notes for us. And so, um, with that, I guess I'd like to turn it over to you all and, and hear what your thoughts are and initial reactions. 